Great, yeah. So welcome everybody to our first um, SOAS Japan Research Centre seminar of, of 2020-21. Uh, where this is the 42nd year of our seminar series, but this is the first time it's been virtual. Uh, but maybe that's quite a good thing, actually, because we've been oversubscribed for this seminar. Uh, Nick is a very popular man. Uh, so just to let you know that we are recording this um, seminar because a lot of people weren't able to uh, join it because of over oversubscription. And also we thought it would be nice for people to listen to it afterwards. So we're going to put it on our website afterwards. So just to let you know, we're recording it. So I'm Helen McNaughton, I'm Chair of the Japan Research Centre, and uh, I'm de really delighted to welcome our speaker, who's going to kick off the series for us this year. He's Nick Bradley. And uh, first of all, what I should say is congratulations, Nick. You've had quite a year. You've become Dr. Bradley. You've graduated in your PhD, and you've also uh, published your debut novel, which we're mainly going to talk about tonight, The Cat in the City. Uh, it's been reviewed by The Times, it's been reviewed by The Guardian, you've been on the Joe Wiley uh, Book Club on Radio 2, but obviously tonight is the pinnacle of your career coming on the JRC seminar series and being interviewed by me, so you know it doesn't get better than that. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to have an interview style chat uh, between Nick and myself. Uh, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A at the end. So uh, I'll let you know when the Q&A starts and you can start typing questions into the chat for Nick. Uh, first of all, I'm sure many of you have seen the book. It's a fantastic uh, book cover. I bought the hardback because I, I just like the feel of it. And I'm just going to start by reading the blurb. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read the book and some of you may not have. So just from the blurb, in Tokyo, one of the world's largest megacities, a stray cat is wending her way through the, black, through the back alleys and with each detour, she brushes up against the seemingly disparate lives of the city dwellers, connecting them in unexpected ways. So that's the blurb. Before we start talking about your novel, Nick, I asked you to, uh, the first question I, I gave to you was that I thought it'd be nice for people to understand the connection or any connection with your PhD. So you did a PhD in creative and critical writing from UAE. Uh, which was on the figure of the cat in Japanese literature. So I think you've prepared a little, uh, a little summary of the key findings and, and going to explain to us about the cat in Japanese literature first. OK, okay. yeah. Um, so if, uh, first of all, I should say uh, thank you very much, Helen, for having me on as part of this uh, research seminar series. It's, it's, it's such a privilege to be here. Um, and thank you also, everyone, for turning up. Um, I know there are so many other things that you could be doing, so I, I, I really do appreciate people coming to listen. Um, so I'm going to just share a PowerPoint presentation, hopefully. Right. Um, so uh, I'll just go back. Um, I won't talk too much about my PhD uh, because tonight uh, is Helen wanted me to talk more about writing and about the, the novel. Um, but just as a kind of brief introduction, so uh, my name's Nick. Um, I did my PhD in creative and critical writing at UEA. Um, and the creative and critical writing PhD, often people ask me, what is it? So it's a bit of a, a weird beast. So I thought I would just explain what it is first before I uh, talk a bit more about the critical side. So part of the PhD was the novel, The Cat in the City. And then it also was accompanied by a critical thesis, which examined um, something thematically linked to the fiction that I wrote. So in this case, it, it, it's obvious uh, what I was looking at. I was looking at cats in Japanese literature. So uh, first of all, I've also put um, the Great, uh, Great Britain Sasakawa Foundation uh, down the bottom left of the PowerPoint. I should mention that uh, I was very kindly funded by this uh, organization throughout the time of my PhD. So I'm, I'm very much grateful to them and their support. Um, okay, so the critical side of the PhD was split up into four parts. So I was looking at in the first part, a kind of overall kind of cat history of Japan, uh, in, a cat history of um, uh, in Japan, uh, in art and in literature. And then after that, I looked at three popular um, 20th century male authors um, who span the 20th century, uh, beginning with Natsume Sosaki, 
then Tamizaki Jinshiro, and then ending up with Murakami as the kind of contemporary novelist. Um, so one of the things that kind of started this off was um, I began writing the book before I started the PhD. Um, but one of the reasons I started writing the book was because I started to see a kind of trend in the UK of um, cat books from Japan becoming popular. And that kind of intrigued me. And, and I, I read a few of them and, and uh, I thought, oh, that's an interesting approach to, to writing about a city. Um, so I wanted to write my own one. Um, but then I also sort of, I started to see other things that were, there were also cats on the covers of books where there weren't necessarily cats in the books. And that this was a kind of a, a weird trend that was coming from Japan as a kind of export, but it was definitely something that was being becoming popularized in, in the UK. So from my reading that I'd done uh, a long time ago, I thought about all of the authors who I'd read who had started this trend of, of cats in literature. And I thought I would just sort of deep dive into it and, and really look harder at at the concept itself. So uh, the reason I got that picture of the cat with the ship hat on is because cats were not originally indigenous to Japan. They were brought over um, with Buddhist scriptures and they were brought over to protect Buddhist scriptures from being eaten by rats and mice on board the ships. And then they were taken to different uh, temples throughout Japan to carry on um, guarding the scriptures. So the cat kind of entered Japanese society at quite a high level, at quite a exalted level. Um, but then uh, other pictures I've got down here. So uh, down the bottom left, you can see that there was um, a very famous incident from uh, Genji Monogatari, the tale of Genji, which involves a cat, uh, a Chinese cat. Um, so that also shows that the cats were being used as a kind of uh, a courtly possession at that time. Um, but that incident in Genji um, was illustrated a lot and that kind of popularized the depiction of cats in art. Uh, and then there was another um, artist, uh, Utagawa Kuniyoshi, who popularized the depiction of cats in art. Um, so moving quickly on, um, one of the things that kind of interested me about cats in Japanese culture is something that you can even see in your smartphones today. If you load up your emoji tray, which comes from Japan originally, that um, I'm sure a lot of people in, in the audience are very familiar with Japan, but I'm going to explain things as if people weren't familiar with Japan. So the word emoji comes from Japan. Uh, so e means picture and moji means characters. So these are kind of uh, pictorial messages that started off with uh, Japanese flip phones and, and sending out emails. But one of the interesting things about emoji is if you click on the tabs on most of most smartphones, uh, you'll find that the, there's a human tab, which has uh, lots of human expressions, has a lot of mythical beasts. Uh, for example, you can see there, there's a, a clown, there's um, uh, yeah, so the space invaders as robots, but then you have a, a whole string of cats with a variety of, of, of human expressions. So that kind of interested me the way that, that the cat was the only real animal that was featured in the human emoji tray. Whereas if you go along to the animal section, you'll find the monkeys, uh, the famous uh, three monkeys from um, Nikko Shrine, you'll find them in, in the animal tray. But you'll also find the cat there, but it's weird that the only real animal that's used to depict human emotions in Japanese culture is the cat. Anyway, sorry, that was a bit of a, a digression. So I went out to Japan uh, uh, and thanks also to Santander who provided a, a mobility fund for me to go uh, and research one of my authors. So again, people might be familiar with this author, but um, Natsume Soseki, he wrote uh, a book called I Am A Cat, it, which was a serialized novel so it started out as a short story and became um, a big quite a big tome in the end um, but Natsume Soseki's uh, for me he's the beginning of, of the modern novel and modern cat novel so he was a really important author for me to look at so um, but while I was out there I also took opportunity to go and see uh, a cat shrine and to pray at a cat shrine that I would pass my PhD and uh, I'm, I'm glad that 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 worked out um, so with Soseki, I was looking through his, his books and his diaries, and I was looking at the, the notes he was making in his books. And I, I found this one interesting thing here from a book he had called Imaginations in Animals. And uh, it said, in a word, animals can invent according to the extent that they can dissociate. And um, that book was, uh, so obviously Soseki studied in, in the UK, in, in Britain in 1902. And he was, um, he was a fluent English speaker and he was a, he was a, a scholar of, of British literature. 
Um, but that line there kind of links to this, um, another concept that I became interested in in writing, which was dis um, defamiliarization. So there was a Russian critic, Viktor Shlovsky, who pointed out this uh, characteristic of, uh, in writing of, of defamiliarization, where the writer shows the familiar as the unfamiliar. Uh, and in this case with Soseki, it's, it's showing the familiar Japan to the Japanese, but through the eyes of a cat. Um, sorry, moving quickly on. So then um, the, the next author I looked at was um, Tanizaki Junichiro, who wrote a book called A Cat, a Man and Two Women. Um, and this book was interesting because uh, the cat in this book is, is a, a Western cat. And rather than have the cat narrate the book, in, in his book, the cat is almost like a blank slate that the human characters project their emotions onto. So I was, I was interested in, in, in the way that he used the cat, but in a, in a different way to Soseki. And then there was Murakami, who I'm, I'm sure everyone's familiar with here. Uh, and analyzing Murakami's work became quite difficult because he's written so many books and, and so many of them feature cats that um, I think you could write a whole PhD thesis just on Murakami and cats. So instead, what I tried to do was step back a little bit and I did a more of a kind of data analysis of Murakami. And I looked at the number of times that he uses the word cat in each of his novels from 1979 all the way up to 2020. And I noticed that there was um, a correlation coefficient of about 0.5, which showed a gentle increase over time in, in the number of times that Murakami uses the word cat. Um, what that means, I'm not sure, but the conclusion that I came to with the three different novelists who I looked at, were that they used the cat in, in quite different ways, but um, each time it was an important key uh, to their writing, in particular with Murakami. Um, so I would say that Murakami's tying in with this concept of neconomics that, that people are talking about recently, that the, the idea that cats are actually boosting the economic power of Japan. Um, anyway, right, I think I've talked a bit too much about my PhD now, so I'll, I'll be quiet. Thank you, Nick, that's great. Um, I, I'm, I'm quite afraid that neconomics might become more popular than womanomics and, and uh, abonomics, actually. So thanks for that. So that's brilliant. So normally in a JRC seminar, we might spend the whole hour just dissecting your research. And I'm sure there are some literature specialists in, in our audience who may want to ask questions. But I want to turn to your novel now. Um, I just want to raise the, um, the poem that you start in, your, in the epigraph of your novel. There's a poem there, Ao Neko, which you've translated, Blue Cat. Um, is that significant? What, I assume it is. You put it in the epigraph. Do you want to talk about the poem? Yeah, it was, it was, um, it was one of those like amazing finds. Um, so I actually stumbled across the poem, I think, when I was about 70% through writing the book. And it was actually, a, um, I think it was a, a Japan Studies event. And I met, uh, I can't remember his name, but he was one of the Sysjack fellows at the time. And I was talking to him about my PhD. And he said, oh, have, are you looking at Hagiwara Sakutaro, the poet? And I said, oh, I'm not. And he said, oh, you should. He's got some great poems about cats. And as I was going through his stuff, I stumbled upon this one poem. And it was, it was crazy because so many of the themes in his poem coincided with with what I'd written already um, so it just seemed like the, the perfect epigraph um, yeah and I, I translated it myself because the translation I I'd seen of it I didn't it it was good but it wasn't quite what I wanted so I, I translated it myself but that also had the added bonus of of it, it being able uh, you know I could reproduce it because uh, I think the the poem, the Japanese poem is in public domain. So if I translated it, it was fair game. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you. All right, let's 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 delve into your novel. Uh, I'm sure many people have read it, but it, um, it is a novel, but it's a collection of short stories, but very interconnected stories, which become even more interconnected as you go through the novel. I mean, I loved it. I have to say, I loved, I loved the novel. I think it's brilliant. Um, I couldn't put it down uh, once I started reading it. But let's go feline first. Let's talk about the cat. So it's a calico cat. Um, I sense it's a female cat. In fact, I, uh, the blurb says she. Yeah, so it's a female cat, but it does read very female as well. Um, is there any particular significance on choosing the calico cat at all? 
that breed? Yes, uh, there was. Um, and it goes back to Natsume Soseki. So his his cat in, in the Japanese is Mikeneko, um, which could be translated as tortoise shell, could be translated as tortoise shell and white or calico. Um, I went with calico because I like the alliteration of calico cat. So nice. that was the, the root of it, yeah. I read somewhere that um, calico male cats are quite rare for some reason and, and calico female, cat, cat, I didn't know that. So I, is that why the cat's female or you just wanted her to be female anyway? Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, calicos are, are predominantly female. Um, so the males are really rare. I think he, perhaps in the the first draft of the first story I ever wrote, I think it, I think the the cat might have been male, and I might have switched the cat to be female to coincide with the fact that she was calico. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, okay. and also I think I, I had some idea originally where I wanted the gender of the cat to be ambiguous and sort of to be revealed at the end, but I think I threw that idea out the window. Yeah. Great. So I read that blurb out to everybody uh, because it has this connotation that we're going to be going into these short stories where the cat is wending away through the city and, and brushing up against people. And uh, so that was my expectation when I went into the novel. And this is by no means a criticism at all, but I found that um, I, well, I expected this, the cat to be very central to the storyline. And that's true in some of the stories. But in many of the stories, I found that uh, it's actually the characters who are connected together in different ways. Um, in some stories, you know, the cat is far less real, even at times very peripheral, sometimes not actually in the story physically, um, on a glass, maybe on a, a photograph or image, or sometimes a fleeting glimpse. And then you do mention uh, Bake Neko as well. So I wanted you to just, sometimes you get the sense there's more than one cat, although I think you want us to believe that there's just one cat in the story, but there's also these sort of ghost cats and, and other cats floating. So talk, talk us through a little bit more about, about the cat. But for me, it was less central to the storyline than I expected, but still, still very crucial, obviously. Yeah, um, so I think, that sort of came about because when I first started writing the book, um, my my tutor at the time when I was doing the MA in creative writing, um, who then went on to become my supervisor, he he suggested to me that I that I should sometimes the cat should feature more and sometimes the cat should feature less. And I thought long and hard about that bit of advice that he'd given me. And I started to think that actually what was fun about connections between short stories or, or these kind of linked linked novels that where, where things all connect up um was also what also would be fun would be for a reader to be expecting a cat to come but to not be sure when it was going to come um so i like the idea that sometimes the cat is a big presence in a story but sometimes you can only hear the sound of the cat or sometimes it's just a photograph of the cat but i thought that 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 also would be a fun thing for readers, almost like a kind of where's Wally, um, <laughs> you know, trying to find Wally. So in each story, people would be thinking, oh, when's the cat gonna come? How's the cat gonna feature? Because the cat was also always gonna be a linking device. Um, so I, th I thought that, that could be fun for readers, yeah. Yeah, I th well, I think you've done a brilliant job then. I, I hadn't thought of it as where's Wally, but it's a very sophisticated <laughs> where's Wally. But certainly I think that's true. I was always, after a while, I was always waiting for the cat to appear. Is it going to be in the story itself? Is it going to be depicted some, you know, in some other fleeting way? So yeah, you've done a, a, a great job of that. Um, but let's go a little bit non-feline. Let's go into the human characters uh, because the beauty of the novel, of course, is the interconnectedness of their lives. Um, they're, they're connected to each other through the cat sometimes, but they are also connected to each other. Sometimes they are related or they know each other. Uh, sometimes they flow past each other without actually meeting, but they're somehow connected. Um, it's beautifully written the way you build up that interconnectedness as the stories progress. Some, uh, obviously some of the characters reappear in later stories, they pop in and out of each other's stories. So how did you, 
you've got this great build up. How did you decide the sort of sequence of the stories? How did you how did you decide which, which characters were going to be main and which were going to be a bit more fleeting and which ones would pop up again? It's quite a big question, I know, but that sequence is is really quite important to this to the stories. Yeah, um, I think I think what I did was um, I think I, I considered each each story in isolation as I wrote it. Um, and I, I, I kind of gathered together all these short stories um, that I'd written and I, I thought, you know, this, this works as a short story by itself and I would kind of put it aside and then I'd make another one. And I gradually over time, the more kind of building blocks that I constructed, that was when I started to say, you know, and perhaps to begin with, I had ideas where I, I wanted to do this, I wanted to do that. Maybe, maybe those things didn't work out. Um, but some of the some of the nice little connections started to appear as I was as I had all the stories in front of me and as I was editing them. I also kind of I, I thought you might ask this, so I, I got this out. But this is my notebook. <laughs> it's a jigsaw like puzzle. Crazy, wasn't it? <laughs> crazy maps connecting up all the sh short stories and just trying to make sure that there were at least two or three connections between every story. Um, because that was really important to me. I always wanted it to feel more like a novel than a, a collection of short stories. Mm. Um, and the sequence, I think, um, I moved things around. So, and I started to think about the flow of a novel. And um, so, for example, something bad might happen at the end of this story, uh, which send us, into, send us into a bit of chaos in this story. And then that story afterwards would be the story where there's a bit of redemption. And, and so I thought, a, also, I thought about like almost like making a mixtape. I know that might sound a bit like a, a cliche, but no, that's from my era as well. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm much older than you. Carry on. <laughs> no, um, yeah. I, I, so I thought about how how things would flow, um, and and that was that was really important to me that that it you know that it did feel like a progression. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a very complicated process. I mean, that mapping out and the jigsaw puzzle, I mean, you've, that must have been very complicated to go back and revisit and link it all up. But you've done, you've done a brilliant job. For anybody who hasn't read it yet, you know, you start out thinking they're going to be individual stories, maybe with some connection to the cat, but it just builds up into this crescendo of, of, of interconnectedness, which is great. Um, so obviously the cat is, is a linking uh, component throughout the story but for me one of the most central linking characters is uh, Nishi Furuni who's a, a science fiction writer um, and the story that focuses on him the most is Copycat which is right in the middle of the novel so I assume that was part of your sequencing that but for me that was a crucial middle point. He's the only character who uh, pretty much connects all the others in various ways. He's the only one who's already deceased as well. The rest are still alive. Uh, we won't. I'm trying not to spoil too much of the plot lines and the characters <laughs> for people because you know they want to read the book if they haven't done so already. But tell us a little bit about that Nishi character. He's a sci-fi fiction writer. Is he based on uh, anybody from a real author from Japanese literature? Is he, is he completely made up? And, and am I right in that? I mean. It, it's open to interpretation, of course, but is he, a, is he the central linking figure alongside the cat? Yeah, um, he, he is, isn't he? Um, now I come to think of it. Um, it so he, in answer to the first part of the question, he, he is based on, he's, he's, the foundations of him are based on, on a real Japanese writer, who I also happen to have here. So, um, You've come so the, clue, the clue is in the name, right? So his name is Nishi Furumi. Um, so it, it, I chose Nishi because it kind of rhymes with Hoshi mm -hmm. and I chose Furuni because it was um, the opposite of Shinichi. So he's based on Hoshi Shinichi. So okay. instead of uh, new one, he's old two. Um, so that, yeah. that was a bit, a bit um, <laughs> exposing giving away that. But yeah, so he, he is he's like his name is based on on the, the sci fi writer Hoshi Shinichi. Um, but uh, he himself as a character is, is, is more a kind of creation um, of, of, you know, of, of an idea of, of, of a, a fictional writer. Um, I think, I, I, don't, I don't think I set out for him to be such a keystone. Um, I think it was more like, actually, like one of the things I wanted to do with the book was make sure that each story, like that there was a different genre 
um, because I'm not a big fan of, of, of genre, the way that we split the bookshop off up into different sections. I've never really understood why we do that. I mean, I understand fiction and nonfiction, but I've never really understood why we put all the crimes together, all the sci-fi <laughs> together. I, and I, I, you know, because I like to read all of it. So I, one, of, one of the things I wanted to do was write a book that had all of these elements. And I think I had a sci-fi story and I wrote that as, as it stood, but then I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if one of the characters translated that? And actually it was, you know, so I think that's how he, he came about as a character. Um, yeah, yeah. Great. And we, we find out, of course, uh, that he is quite obsessed with cats, not only in, the, in his science fiction writing, which gets revealed, but also in when he was alive, when he lived, he, ha he, had, uh, he had cats. Um, and one of which of his favorite cat was called Naomi, which is one of your more mysterious, exotic characters in the book, the, the, the quite exotic Naomi, who, well, again, I don't want to spoil plots, but I'm assuming <laughs> most people have read the book, but um, who's quite sort of an exotic character. I mean, she pops up in McDonald's, she pops up pole dancing, but she's also, you know, a bit of a ghost, a uh, bit of a elusive, is she real? Is she a cat herself? Uh, do you want to talk about Naomi or should we leave that to the imagination? So I don't want to spoil the, the, the story, <laughs> but I think I can, I can just give away like a little, a little thing about, about where Naomi comes from. So, so the, her name is, is a reference to, to Tanizaki Jinichiro's book, um, Chijin no Ai, so, uh, which is translated as Naomi. Um, so that was a little bit of a nod to Tanizaki because he's like one of my favourite authors I wouldn't even say Japanese authors he's one of my favorite authors um so ne the the name Naomi came from that um but I won't I won't spoil the um <laughs> the, the thread yeah. that runs through um yeah. yeah yeah and I also I I I always want to leave the ambiguity of of the possibilities of what who who Naomi might be mm. um yeah I, the imagination I, yeah yeah well she's a very good character she's uh, both exotic and elusive at the same time so um when I looked at the table of contents initially I saw that they were individual stories but you have three stories where Ishikawa detect the detective Ishikawa he gets three stories um and I thought I thought maybe he would be the central linking you know that when I looked at the table of contents I thought he would be the linking uh, between some of the stories and it's less that I, I still stand by my sort of interpretation and others might disagree that that Nishi is the linking character along with the cat. But why did why did the detective get three stories in his, in his own right? <laughs> what yeah, made you decide that's, that? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so the, the simple answer to that is because I've got a really, really good ed editor. Um, so if she's watching Poppy... Is he on the line? Is he, uh, is he? She, she's awesome. <laughs> she's the best. Um, but basically, um, so Poppy read, you know, obviously... Oh, so, yeah, oh there I'm, she is. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I said he, she. <laughs> so um, Poppy read the whole book and, and was really, you know, really positive about it. But um, her, her two big notes when, when it came back, I'll talk about the other note uh, later, but the, one of the big notes was that um, because originally the detective story was the second to last story it was the penultimate story okay and so her what she said was was really true was that it brought up too many issues too late in the book mm -hmm. um and I was scared I didn't want to throw out that story because um I love detective stories and and it would that would have been my crime story out of the window um <laughs> so instead, what I thought would be a good idea, I, I chopped that single story up into three and then I laced it throughout the whole book. And so Poppy was completely right in, in what she said about about the story. But the way that I fixed it was by was wasn't by just throwing out the story, but was by thinking, well, how could I how could I reconfigure this story? Uh, and also, I think, again, I, it's really difficult to not give spoilers, isn't it? But mm. I think that the detective is integral to the the ending even though he might seem like he's tangential um so i won't say any more than that because uh, yeah I, I don't want to spoil it. yeah okay well well done poppy i think there's a lesson there for anybody who wants to write a novel you need a great idea you need the ability to write it but you need a really good editor as well so there you go speak to poppy um so let's move to talk about the city tokyo itself so 
for lack of a better word, there's sort of three main actors in the novel. There's there's the cat, uh, there's all the characters, uh, and then there's the city. And of course, it's called the cat and the city. Um, so you've lived in Japan for a long time. You clearly understand Japanese life and, and, and Tokyo city life. In many ways, this, this novel, these stories, is, is very much a love letter to Tokyo. But at the same time, Tokyo life is portrayed quite brutally. I mean, it's harsh. Um, you know, it's unforgiving, precarious. Many of the characters are on the outside of society, discontent. I mean, I suppose there's no value in writing about happy, contented characters. I mean, <laughs> discontent <laughs> sells more novels. But um, do you want to talk about the city itself as, as, as one of the key actors? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's completely true what, what, what you say, though. Um, because I, I think, you know, I've, I've always wanted to be a writer ever since I was a, a child. And I, I went to Japan, I think, uh, because I wanted to see, you know, see the world and learn things and learn, learn a new culture and a new language. Um, and originally I was, I was based down in Hiroshima and I had a, a lovely, amazing life in Hiroshima, but I got zero fiction out of it. Um, because, <laughs> too, yeah. <laughs> too easy. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, but when I was a bit older, I moved to Tokyo and it had always been a dream to move there. And I, I do love Tokyo mm. and I can appreciate it more now. Um, and when I go back there, I, I really, I really enjoy being there. But I think um, the situation where I th that I was living in in Tokyo when I was working for a Japanese company alongside, you know, uh, fellow Japanese um, employees, I, it was such a different life to 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 what I'd seen before and what I'd experienced before. And to be quite honest, it was tough. It was really hard. It you know the long hours, the overtime, the commuting. It, it was brutal, um, you know, uh, so it, it made me to start to think that there'd been a lot of writing about Japan where I think either people go to Japan, you know, kind of live an expat life or, you know, the foreigners, the fish, fish out of water kind of story. Um, and, I, and I thought, actually, there's more interest and in, there's, there's, there's more in terms of drama and in terms of, of, of you know, really, really like tough living there's more just around you know around me every day in my, in my life here and so I wanted to kind of capture that in a book instead of this kind of um this idea of adventure and, and exploration um I wanted to 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 try and 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 depict some of the things that my colleagues would say to me when they were you know when they were drunk and, and they were opening up um which is quite often the case in Japan um you know, I, I felt like there were so many kind of sad lives trapped in, in, in this thing. And, and, and I, I kind of identified with it at the same time because I felt trapped too. So, um, yeah, it felt it felt like that. It felt easier to write about those things, ironically, than than than, you know, kind of perfect life or a perfect existence. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you've ca you've captured that brilliantly, and uh, I'm sure many of us who have, have lived in Japan or, or even in Tokyo you know are aware of that side of life and one of my favorite lines from from which i think captures what you've just been talking about is salary man souls smashing against existence I, I think that's a great line that just captures a lot of what you've been talking about and and the brutality of of being a salary man in, in tokyo and, and and working so yeah well done for capturing that so it is quite you know, Tokyo life and the city, the way it comes alive, it is quite brutal in many ways. It's quite harsh. But at the same time, there's a lot of hope in the book. I mean, we talk, I talked about, you know, we've talked about how discontented the characters are and, and there's a lot of unhappy lives going on. But at the same time, there's a lot of hope in the book and there's resolution. And for some of the characters, that's not immediate. You know, you leave some of the stories, the plot lines sort of hanging. You're not sure of the fate of some of those characters. But then some of them you later on you can glean or sometimes it's very prominent that there is some kind of resolution for their story at least for now so for some characters there's a there's an ending or, or resolution for the for the reader and some that their their fates are undecided their plots are left hanging you don't revisit them um so i don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that yeah um so this is great i can i can fall back on on the brilliant editor again so, <laughs> so yeah, poppy. Go poppy. yeah poppy yeah 
Um, originally, uh, I, I wrote a, a, a final story of, a, you know, an ending that was called Opening Ceremony, and it was more of a roving, like, moving POV that um, it was, I tried to base it off um, Madame Bovary, the fairground scene, um, and what I was trying to do with it was I was trying to wrap up every single character in the book, and again, Poppy said to me, you know, it's fine if we can go with it if you want, but I think I think we can do something a bit better here. Like I think you know you, you could go another the extra mile and 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 she she asked for a quieter story that focused in more. And I'm really glad that we that we did that and that I wrote I rewrote the the final mm -hmm. story. Um, I kept the title opening ceremony because for me it, it's instead of being about the Olympics, it, it turned into more of a story. I used it in a different sense. It became more about opening up and and communicating and showing people your feelings and and, and talking um so i took the same title um but I, I i thought well how can i spin that how can i take that theme um yeah so it it, it I, I know some 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 stories feel unresolved or, or or they kind of disappear into darkness but i think with with that progression, um, and I, th I was thinking about this earlier, um, con relating back to the last question, is that a good character tends to want something. Uh, they tend to, to not not be completely content because um, characters and plots are, are sort of dependent on desire. And um, but then at the same time, a plot requires change, and it requires um, you know people to undergo uh, change and to, you know to grow as people. So that was that was one of the interesting things I thought about about progression of character and and how even if there is unhappiness, even if there is isolation, that watching characters change for the better is is a more pleasant feeling. Um, yeah. yeah. No, that's great. I mean, it always leave the reader wanting more. <laughs> uh, and and uh, you know sometimes resolution in life like you say is transient you might have sort of a happy ending at this point but then something else happens there's twists and turns in life and I think you capture that that really well that there there isn't that finite ending which is which is brilliant I want to go back to that um, brief mention of the Olympics that you did but I, I want to do that in a minute but I want to give you a chance to and I think I think you've prepared something here to okay. talk about the visuals in your book, because there are some very interesting visuals that you've incorporated in one of the stories. There's some photographs, which I assume you've taken yourself for copyright purposes. And then uh, and then there's one story, which is one of my favorite stories, actually, because it's really poignant and it turns into a manga. And. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned different genres because I'm not a fan of sci-fi. I'm not actually a fan of manga, but that became, I didn't think I was going to like that story, but that became one of my favorite stories because it's such a poignant story. Uh, it's one of the few stories too, where the cat is actually living with someone for a while, uh, which I quite liked. Uh, so I'm going to give you a chance to show some of the visuals and, and talk about them a little bit more because I think they're really interesting. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just fire up PowerPoint. Hopefully this, this works. I'm sure it will. It did before. There we go. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the visuals in the book. Um, where are we? Are we working? Yes, we are. Okay. Can everyone see? You can see yeah. that all right? Yeah, good. Okay. So, um, so yeah, the, for people who haven't who are not familiar with the book so each chapter um is is a kind of self-contained story um and it they're, they're kind of like short stories but but they're, they're they're all linked um but i'm gonna just talk about three of them because they they have sort of um peculiar visual layout um so the first one uh, i'm going to talk about is uh uh what helen just just mentioned um the, the photograph so um this is uh, one of the stories called Trophallaxis, and it has, as you can see on on the slide, there's uh, usually an image, and then there's a kind of um, uh, a message underneath. So basically, the, the, the premise is, is that the character is taking photos and he's uploading them to uh, a message board or, or Twitter or you know something like Nichan or whatever. Um, because I wanted to capture that kind of that bad side of the internet, you know, that that kind of negative side, but I also it, it seemed like a great opportunity to incorporate some visuals, uh, some photos, so that people could could see. Um, 
So yeah, so uh, I did take these photos myself. Some of them are not even in Tokyo. This one is in Osaka, so that's... Um, don't ruin them, don't ruin them. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, and this one here, uh, I was telling Helen about this, so I thought I would just, because, you know, for people who've logged in and, or are watching this, I just thought I'd give you a little, little Easter egg. So this, to me, was a perfect photo for, for what I wanted, but I was worried about the number plate. So what I did was I photoshopped the number plate and um, for those who can read Japanese, um, there's the character's name on the top left and then the word for cat in the top right. And then I took the 22-2, which is um, the 22nd of February, which is uh, cat day in Japan because it sounds like meow, 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 which is like a cat <laughs> saying meow, meow, meow. Um, so yeah, that's just a little Easter egg for, for people who've, who've joined us today. Um, so yeah, then the other thing that Helen mentioned, which um, was the manga. So um, for this, I, I, I had a I had a script. So I I, I wrote um, this story after I had a really good um, workshop uh, by the writer Rachel Cusk. So she came to UEA and she gave us a, a really great class on dialogue. So I wrote the story, and central to it was um, a part where. The characters only spoke in, in dialogue and that was it there was there was nothing else it was just um character a character b and it was back and forth and i alternated it and i wanted to be able to, to tell a story just using dialogue but as i wrote the story um it turned into a story about manga so then i got this idea that oh it wouldn't it be great to actually turn just the dialogue into manga and so this is again going back to like my awesome editor my brilliant publishers um, so Atlantic, uh, my publishers, when I met with them and when I met with Poppy, they were so encouraging about some of the weird aspects of the book that I wanted to do. And they not only said, yes, we like it, but you could do it more if you want. And so they encouraged me to um, work with uh, uh, an illustrator. So I got in contact with them. So I think I this was really lucky. I, I posted on my own Facebook and one of my friends who I went to school with replied and said oh you should check out Mariko's work so Mariko is a British Japanese um, illustrator so she grew up in England but she's half Japanese she also had a cat called Neko which is the <laughs> Japanese cat when she was growing up so that was another another um, sign from above um, so Mariko and I collaborated um, over email about a year ago maybe a bit more um, on making this manga um, and it was it was really fun um, working with her but it, it was also quite scary at times because being a writer you usually you become a writer because you want complete control over your work but when you're collaborating with someone you're really giving up your work to other people mm. but the other thing I kind of learned through publishing my first book was that for anyone who wants to be a writer that writing is always collaborating so as I've mentioned earlier about Poppy giving me um, feedback and things like that you're never really writing the book just by yourself you know you have all these people working with you who are really helping you and if, you know they understand your vision and they're trying to help you get there um so you know even the um the lovely drawing on the front of the cover so uh, a, a lady called carmen drew that you know things like that there's so much goes into making a book um but yeah so mariko drew this lovely manga um for me and it was just perfect so I, I picked her out because I loved her style it was a kind of a nice cross between Japanese and, and British and it also had this kind of childish um, I mean that in a good way uh, childlike quality um, that the character who drew it uh, would have uh, so I put Mariko's Instagram uh, down the bottom left so I, I thoroughly recommend you check out her stuff she's doing like an Inktober this month so she's oh, okay. drawing lots of pictures um, so Mariko and I had never met um, but just by coincidence, she was in Norwich on holiday, um, but it was in the height of COVID, obviously. <laughs> um, but yeah, we met up and we, we both signed copies of, of the book in, in Norwich. So that was, uh, that was great. Um, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. So finally copycat. Uh, this was another one that was really important. I'll be quick with this one though. Um, this one, the, the textual layout was really important to me. And again, Atlantic were brilliant working with them. They, they were, they understood how how kind of uh, <laughs> compulsive I am with these things. Um, so yeah, and uh, as you can see down the bottom, they they also encouraged me to, to. So there was an idea with the story that it was a translated story from Japanese, and it was translated by one of the characters. But 
so poppy also encouraged me to to really do more with that um which i'm really grateful to but it was also a great tool having an english speaker in the book who could actually explain some of the concepts um to non-japanese speakers because um that was an, another thing i wanted with the book i wanted it to be completely accessible to everyone i didn't want it to to cut off people who who didn't know the language or culture yeah so yeah that's um that part so i'll thank you no thank you that's great and uh i, I mean again you did a, you did a brilliant job of that because there are layers within the book the visuals are there as visuals but they are layered into the story so it becomes apparent why it turns into a manga uh it, it becomes apparent why the photog the photographs are in there etc so I th and and the trans the stories within stories within stories is, is really apparent as well with the translations and the the sci-fi fiction so it's it's really great it really layers throughout it um i just want to touch briefly on the olympics because uh you mentioned that your last chapter is called opening ceremony and actually uh, there's a real build up to the olympics throughout so you know references and connections to the olympics are dotted throughout the novel some of the characters are working and preparing for the olympics themselves it's clearly building up to tokyo 2020 mm. um but the and in the last chapter is called opening ceremony but it really is not about the olympics it's just on you know the day before and the day of and it's it's a totally different story and it's a resolution a, a key resolution story so we won't go into that but the build up to the olympics is portrayed fairly negatively in the story um which you know i love the olympics but i have no problem with anybody portraying it negatively because there is always this dark side and and an underbelly to Olympics not just in Japan but everywhere so mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that that very slow build up uh, to Tokyo 2020 that's the first part but also I mean you pu you published it this year and then Tokyo 2020 didn't happen how do you feel about that sort of <laughs> postponement um, I don't think it detracts from it you haven't got clear dates in there so it could be 2021 when we read it but anyway how do you feel about that yeah, uh, so so many so many complicated emotions there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, Ed, you're exactly right um, about the, the Olympics, and um, I think so. I I know that it's depicted negatively in the book, um, and but I wasn't having I, I wasn't having a dig at Tokyo. No, I think it was it was more to do with the idea of the city changing. So. With characters too, you want you want some kind of change throughout the book. And to me, the idea of the, of the city changing because of the Olympics, because I, you know, I'd seen this with with Beijing and with London. You know, this this idea of the city changing intrigued me, and it kind of, but it also threw up lots of questions. Um, and so I read up a lot on on the Olympics at previous cities, and and saw that there was a, always a trend of 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 moving the homeless out of uh, out of CBDs. You know, cleaning up the streets. Um, but it didn't just stop there. It was also stray, stray dogs and stray cats would be um, rounded up and euthanized. And um, it just started to make me think about some of the characters who I wanted to write about anyway, who were already marginalized or what didn't quite feel like they fit in or felt trapped in society. And so it, it made sense to kind of also follow the the negative um, side effects of, of the Olympics. And I think that kind of came from when I was living and working in Tokyo. I remember it was announced that Tokyo was going to be the 2020 Olympic city. And um, I remember some people weren't happy about that, particularly because of um, issues uh, that they, they felt were still unresolved from the uh, 2011 um, earthquake and tsunami. So I kind of was interested in that in that kind of um, that quiet dissent or that you know that that unrest that unrestful voice in Japan because you know Japanese society is, is very keen on harmony and you know the party line obviously was that everyone was really excited about the Tokyo Olympics um, but I wanted to tap into that the, the voices of, of people who maybe weren't so happy. Um, and and I think one of my earliest memories of of Japan was was the first night that I got off the plane and I was staying in Shinjuku and I just remember being shocked at, at the number of homeless people there, but not just um, 
not just homeless people, but uh, I remember an American friend explaining it to me at the time, but people who were living in kind of cardboard boxes, uh, who were wearing suit, who had suits hung up and, and office shoes and everything, and they were going to go to work the next day. And I was saying, yeah, what's that about? And he, I remember him telling me, oh, you know, it could be someone who's in between apartments and they don't have anyone anywhere to stay. So they're, they're sleeping rough for a bit, but they'll, you know, and, and I got kind of interested in, in, in how homelessness in Japan was kind of swept you know, away and it wasn't talked about, it wasn't commented on. Um, and I, I just, sorry, just another book to, to hold up. I read this after, I, I know some people might be familiar with this, but um, Tokyo Ueno Station by the um, Zainichi Korean writer Yumiri. So I read this after I'd written my book and, and after it had come out, because people had told me that it dealt with a similar issues, one of the stories in mine. And um, I think I didn't read it beforehand because I was worried that there'll be too many similarities. But thinking about it now, I'm actually quite glad that there are similarities. I'm quite glad that I picked up on something that uh, other Japanese writers also picked up on. So yeah, um, I, uh, have, I, have I answered all the questions? I feel like I've you rambled. Have. Yeah, you have, yeah. You've answered that question about, you know, that build up to the Olympics and and you've, you've answered it very well that it captures the changing city. I mean, there are some references to the city having changed, you know, post bubble environment, economic yeah. crash, but most of the changing of the city is through that um, building up to the Olympics, which is which is great. And, and the sort of cleansing of the city, getting ready for the Olympics, which highlights what we were talking about earlier, the discontent, the pre precarious nature of and the harshness of Tokyo life. But my second question was, how do you feel? I mean, you published the book in 2020 and Tokyo 20, 2020 hasn't happened. Is there any discontent with that or is that OK? I mean, I think <laughs> I think yeah. it's fine myself, but I just wanted to ask the question. Yeah, it's been it's just been such a such a mad year for everyone i think you're you know, having a good year yeah it, i mean it's been it's been good in 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 ways and it's been bad in ways but i just mm -hmm. I, I think this this year i think the kind of the adrenaline's kicked in so so many strange things have happened yeah. um that yeah i i don't i'm i'm not I, I don't feel bad that i wrote a book where the future didn't align because it, it has happened a lot in the past. You know, I went to watch Akira at the, at the cinema just last week, the end of last week before it closed. Um, so that cinema is closed for good now. Um, but in, in Akira, you know, the, the Olympics is also predicted in Neo Tokyo. And I, and I, I think that's interesting, isn't it? Where writers or artists depict something and then the future doesn't quite align like George Orwell's 1984, um, even I was thinking about Murakami's um, Ichiku Hachiyon uh, 1Q84, where he has an alternate alternate reality of, of 1984, which is the 1Q84. Um, and I think that in itself is quite is quite interesting, isn't it? Because fiction is about creating this this other world, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's actually it's nicer when this world doesn't align with the fictional world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I think people read to escape. So, yeah, it, it, it's weird, though. I mean, I, I'm still toying with the idea because Poppy asked me if I wanted to write an afterward about the Olympics for, for the paperback. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure. But actually, I wanted to ask you, do, do you think the 2021 Olympics will go ahead? What, what, what are your thoughts? Because I'm, I'm... <laughs> Whenever I'm asked that question, so I, I, I give some comment and then the next day something immediately changes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to give the. I mean, I, I at the moment I think it it will could will go forward in some downscaled, downsized uh, version, but who knows? I mean, like you say, this is a really strange year, strange times. Nothing is aligning, so I don't know. I don't want to answer the question because every time yeah. I write, every time I write something on it, something else happens. Um, <laughs> Right, so I've got a, a final because uh, I'm conscious that we've, our hour is nearly up, and I want to open it up to the to the audience as well. So, um, got a little bit of a personal question, if I may. So, yep. there's lots of interesting characters in your book, and I just wondered. It's often said that writers write about what they know or their first-hand experience. Um, is any of you in the book, are you, is any of the characters based even remotely on bits of you or your character is in any of the characters, your personality, or obviously you've lived in Japan. Um, yeah. I just wondered if you were in the book a little bit. 
I've got a cheat answer and then I've got an honest answer. And I'll, I'll give you both, actually. Okay. The, the cheat answer is that um, that all of my characters contain me. You know, they're all related to me in some... I mean, obviously, I want to distance myself from some of the more peculiar... Yeah, maybe the Trophallaxis guy. Well, yeah. Maybe not so good to associate with no. them, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so ob obviously, some of them are uh, uh, I, I don't agree with, you know, ethically, morally... <laughs> um but they they all come from a place of love i mean um i think it was uh elizabeth strout was talking about her characters and how she she stopped for her writing became easier when she stopped judging her characters and i i i, I think that's really true you know i i i i do love all of my characters like even the weird ones like there, there's something there's something about them that that attracted me and that's why I, I that's why they popped into my mind mm. that's the, that's the cheat answer but the honest answer is that I definitely and I changed I changed her gender to distance myself from her but Flo is uh -huh. the character who I relate to most um right. you know her, her aspirations like wanting to translate and and wanting to create uh that that you know that was me I think back on you know my lunch breaks when I worked in in the office in Tokyo I would duck out and I would I would try and write I would try and work on 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 a short story or a novel um and and so yeah Flo is someone who I really feel a strong um connection with yeah yeah you've answered my question because I was going to say are you Flo but I thought that would be <laughs> you know really directing the traffic there I'm glad you're not flaky guiding George uh, you know he's, <laughs> Flo, Flo is a much nicer character so that's great and my final question, which I think a lot of people will be interested uh, perhaps to know, and maybe you don't want to give too much away, maybe Poppy will put the put the brakes on here, but I believe you're writing your second novel. Um, you yeah. started writing it. So are there any hints at all uh, in terms of plot or direction or how far you've got? Anything, any sort of teasers before, before Poppy says, no, don't say anything? Yeah, I'll just okay um it, I, she's yeah. featured very heavily <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> um so yeah I, I recently i've been kind of i've been wondering why writers don't talk about what they're working on um and i think it's probably some kind of fear that it won't come to it won't materialize um you know that it won't it won't get finished or it wouldn't find you know it wouldn't find readers you know so I can I think that's why maybe writers are hesitant to talk about them but I mean I can just say that the thing I'm working on um it does have it does have a, a Japanese element but it's it's not entirely Japan so um I can say that much and I can say that I can probably just say that that frogs might feature in it oh um, yeah okay so but, not entirely Japan and we're going we're suddenly leaping into frogs now very exciting yeah. okay so that's a bit of a teaser for everybody i think um yeah okay so i want to open it up to people um i'm just gonna have a look at the q a function uh yeah so there are some stories here uh can you see them as well or not is it only me who oh, can yeah. read them if you open up the q a chat yep um so we've got a couple here from uh agatha even though the stories intersect and overlap, each one is distinctive. Which of those styles was easy for you to adopt? Um, did any of them, were any of them unexpected? Uh, I think you've answered the question one about literary inspiration, actually. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. If I, if I click answer live, does that like display the question or how, how does it, should I do uh, that? What happens there, Charles? I'm not sure. I'm, well, you, I'm not I think... sure about that one, actually. But okay. if, if you just answer as you are now, yeah. that should be fine. Let's leave okay. the buttons. Don't touch any okay. buttons. You don't know what happens. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, yeah, was it easy to adopt different styles? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. I don't know if that answers whether it was easy or not. It, it, it was a, it was a challenge and I think writing sometimes it's, it's really good to set yourself constraints um to not I think sometimes sometimes people go blank with writing because I think because of the infinite possibilities um so when faced with the white sheet what what people are really scared of is just it's just 
the infinite like I could do anything what what should I do so I think sometimes like giving yourself constraints um it be it a voice or a little thing like um for example in, in trophallaxis um I remember so I have I have worked in a factory um years and years ago when I worked for a Japanese company um they made you work in the factory even if you weren't if even if your job wasn't on the factory floor so I spent a month working making cars and um and I remember that the, the process of, of doing the same thing every 90 seconds was terribly, it, it, it was mind numbingly <laughs> boring. Um, what, what, and what, th what kind of drove me crazy on that job was you would have to sort of semi-concentrate, but then your mind would wander. So I tried to recreate that in, um, in the story by setting a, a, a timer for 90 seconds. And I would write for 90 seconds. And then when the alarm went off, I would stop. And um, and I, I did that over and over again to try and replicate that 90 second interval of being in a factory and working in a factory. So I don't know if that really answers the question. It was it was easier for me to set myself constraints and to try and work within um, a strict uh, uh, parameter than it was to, to you know, to, to just think, well, I can do anything. Yeah, great. Yeah. There's a couple of just nice comments here rather than questions. So people saying I like the manga section of the book um, and lovely to be here and listen to you speak about the book. But there's a question here from Paulina, who's one of our seminar speakers coming up later in the series, actually. And she's saying um, she's thinking through the Japanese authors who wrote about cats and they're all men, uh, all male authors. So are there any female Japanese authors who use cats to explore envision and construct their words, their worlds, sorry. Uh, and did you think about gender when you were writing up? I mean, I think you've already made yourself female and flow the character, but she's got asking a much more serious question there. Yeah, that's that's a really, really good question. I, I probably should have, I should have mentioned this in, in the um, uh, in the PowerPoint I, I gave. So what the reason I chose the three male authors was because I'd read um, at the time, I think it was Lynn Truss wrote um, an article in The Guardian about um, if a woman in, in, Brit in the British publishing industry associates herself with cats, that she basically is, um, she, she's put on the scrap, scrapyard. Um, and that got me thinking, uh, oh, isn't it, isn't it interesting that in Japan, lots of very macho masculine authors are like mad on cats i mean um, mishima yukio too uh you know he was a cat lover um even though i think in um sailor who fell from grace from the sea there's some really awful scenes with a cat but um yeah so i was kind of intrigued by why it was considered kind of very masculine writerly um to, to write about cats so that was the reason i chose three men but the interesting thing is going back to the initial cat story in japan is that of course uh, tale of genji was written by a woman so that that was also kind of interesting to me, the way that perhaps it was it was the um, in in the court in in Heian period it was it was females who were interested in cats, but then for some reason um, cats became just this kind of thing that, that it was fine for men or women to like. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think that's that was my reason for showing them. Also, they they worked really nicely for me because they split the they, they span the 20th century perfectly like beginning middle end and i there are lots of female writers you know throughout um the history of the modern <laughs> novel who write about cats um but i was kind of i was interested in these these ones who are kind of marketed as international writers um you know who are really pushed abroad um yeah so i don't know if that answers the question but that that, that was my thinking behind picking mm. those three yeah great uh, so there's a comment here saying the Midnight Diner TV series has a fixed point in the restaurant with all these inter inter overlapping stories and interconnecting characters coming in and out. I love that series, actually. That's a really nice TV series if, if anybody wants to watch that. Whereas yours is a story of a journey of the cat going through the city. So I think that's a, a comment rather than a question there. But it's, that's an interesting uh, comment. Um, yeah, um, just just uh, on that. Yeah, though, go ahead. I, I, I realized um, that one, so I've, I've you know, obviously I've been trying to write for years. I've, I've aborted loads of novels and short stories over, over time, but I realized recently that um, I started out thinking that I might write um, based upon a, a Japanese writer, a female Japanese writer who wrote a book called Hankyu Densha, um, which is set on the, the Hankyu line in, in Kansai. 
and each chapter is a station and it's about characters who get on and off the train and I thought oh, I might try and do something like that but in Tokyo on the Chuo line but I ended up turning the train into a cat but then the thing that uh, was interesting to me is that I've since realized that she's the same author um, Hiro Arikawa who wrote the Traveling Cat Chronicles so I'm kind of intrigued that we both are interested in this idea of connectivity and and yeah so I, I don't know if that answers the question but um, the train itself is more kind of a, a static uh, moving mm. uh, place yeah yeah great so uh, Christopher Hood from Cardiff University asks um, what are you working on now so we've kind of answered that you've given a few teasers um, does it make it harder to remember the first book when you're doing seminars and interviews like this or when you're already writing the second book? And second, uh, he is also a novelist as well. He's written, um, also connected to Tokyo 2020, a, a story about the Shinkansen and a mystery in, in Tokyo 2020. So he says, what tips would you give to someone like me who's been self-publishing that would like to get your novels read more? I believe he's working on the second one as well, like you. So um Maybe if you could answer that question or questions. Um, yeah, it does. I, it does make me so working on this thing now. Uh, I am. But even if I weren't working on this, I would struggle to remember some elements of the book. I don't know why, but you kind of just um, you, f you forget things. Um, it, and that's what makes editing very hard because you you come back to this thing and you think oh did I write I can't remember um so even even if I weren't writing something now I would struggle to remember um I just realized should I put a light on it's a bit dark no you're fine all right okay um <laughs> yeah the other thing the tip I I'm not sure because I don't know I don't know anything about self-publishing um I think I've always I've always aimed for the traditional route and I've never really thought about um, self-publishing although I know it's it's like a huge thing now um, but I think partly the reason why I like the traditional route is I didn't want to think about a lot of the things that's that self-published authors have to think about and I think they they gain a lot more control in in some respects but then they then they they have to um, how can I put it they have to dedicate a lot of time to those things um, so I don't know I think I mean I think Chris should uh, you should be shopping around for an agent I think. <laughs> I think it might be time he's just reminded me that he's actually working on number three now so he's already published two novels uh, they have connections to Shinkansen, Mystery, Tokyo 2020 as well um, so anybody who's interested in reading more Japanese based novels, Japan based novels check out Christopher Hood's novels and then yeah maybe you should get yourself a poppy or an agent Chris uh, let's let's see how it goes but um, right uh, somebody asks uh, what's your favorite thing about the Japanese language and um, do you think being fluent in Japanese has affected how you write in English? That's from Julianne, that question. Well, that's a good question. Um, what's my favorite thing about the Japanese language? I love so many things about Japanese. Um, I mean, obviously kanji is, is, is a, a big contender. Um, I, I, love, I love how you can, you can depict complicated ideas and concepts but in in few characters that's always that's always uh, fascinated me I, and I do love kanji um but what else I love so many things about it I love the fact that there's like 15 to 20 different ways of saying I that then um give a different uh take on on who you think you are in society uh, like ore, boku you know all, all of those um I also like how pronouns are dropped um, because I think it is obvious sometimes when you're when you're asking someone a question or when you're talking about yourself. So uh, th there's so many elements of the Japanese language that I love. Um, I love dialect as well, all the different dialects. Um, I think the learning Japanese, yeah, it affected how I write in English completely. Um, it made me simplify my language, my written language, because when I look at things that I wrote before I moved to Japan, they were too uh, verbose. They were too um, convoluted um and i think that moving to japan um it taught me to to be more economical with words and to try and and that not necessarily like a, a kind of flowery or ornate prose is the best and that sometimes you can you can depict extremely complex and difficult emotions but with very simple words and with very simple actions and i think that that was definitely a product of living in japan and learning the language yeah, yeah. right yeah. 
So sticking with language, um, somebody asked, has your book been translated into Japanese? That's quite a question. I know it's being translated into other languages at the moment. So do you want to talk about that? And But translating into Japanese would really be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, so it's being translated into about eight languages at the moment, um, one of which is Chinese. So there will be some Chinese characters. But at the moment, uh, Japanese, I'm still waiting. I'm hoping. I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Um, yeah, I would love for it to be translated into Japanese, but um, yeah, so far it's, uh, you know, French, Italian, Russian, I won't list them, but yeah, quite a few. Well, that's amazing in itself that it's being translated into eight languages. That's fantastic. I mean, could you expect much more from a debut novel? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure that you could. <laughs> that's been a weird year, it really has. <laughs> um, somebody asks about the autumn leaves story. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you make you frequently make references between Tokyo and other smaller cities in in Japan. So I mean, again, this I think this question is picking up on some of the points we discussed that people in Tokyo tend to be lonely, indifferent, uh, much more in much more complicated uh, situations, even when they're in a relationship compared to perhaps. I mean, you said yourself living in Hiroshima was easier. Um, so yeah, I think that's picking up a little bit more. I don't know if you want to talk about the story Autumn Leaves in more detail without giving away the plot, but... Um, what can I say about <laughs> Autumn Leaves? Uh, it, it's going to sound really bad, but like my, my goal with that story was to, to write the worst relationship I could think of. <laughs> it's pretty bad, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's um, why I'm glad you're not George, you don't end up being George, because <laughs> they're, they're pretty bad at it, those two, yeah. They are, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I wanted that story to be a bit of a car crash, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, what else can I say about it? Um, what, what, I, sorry, yeah. I couldn't find the question. What was the question about? Oh, it's about, you know, it, it, I think it's basically saying, you know, Tokyo is depicted differently to other cities. I mean, uh, I think you're right. And in that, in that story, you're, they, they go to other cities in that story. But really, their car crash relationship is not going to survive in any city, is it? But um, I think the author, uh, yeah. yeah, the comment here is, you know, you're depicting Tokyo life as very different to other cities in Japan. I think it is. I mean, I think it's the same with with most most capitals. I mean, like London is is very different to yeah, Norwich. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here's a very direct question. <laughs> yep. In um, Trophallaxis, mm -hmm. does the robot destroy the guy operating the machine? Ooh. That's a very direct question. I mean, that's going to give away a plot. So, yeah, you know, spoiler, I can't, yeah. yeah, he's not going to answer that one. I'm sorry, MacGyver. Um, we're going to leave that one hanging. That's just going to make people want to read the book now. We'll leave that one hanging. Does the process um, of writing a second novel feel very different now that it's not also tied into the production of the PhD? Yeah, that's a really good that's a really good Very question nice. because I didn't realize actually that you 80% of your PhD was writing the novel. So I thought maybe the PhD came first and then the novel or some kind of mixing, but actually, uh, yeah. So the question is, how do you feel that writing a PhD impacted on that? But how did, how does writing a novel now that's not tied to your PhD? How is that different? That's a great question from Matthew. Um, it, it feels, uh, it feels like I have more freedom because I'm not constrained to, to a topic, but in the same strange way, I've actually set myself a constraint uh, and a topic, um, which I'm trying to keep to. Um, I don't think I talked about this earlier, but um, I found the process of writing creatively and critically at the same time, nearly impossible. Like I, I can't wake up and write creatively on the same day that I write critically. Um, so I would block off time and do them separately always. But one of the things that was really good from the PhD was that I, I developed a system of working even for writing fiction. Um, and I don't think I'll ever produce the thesis alongside the, um, the fiction. I, I mean, I might do, it depends on how mm. I feel, but I think I'll always work as if I were doing the same thing that I were pr producing critical work alongside creative work it's just that I will keep that critical work to myself rather than mm. try and publish it I mean we'll see but um but yeah so I think I'll take I'll, I'll always use this process um because it, it, it's I mean it's it's straightforward isn't it it's research and then mm. write and, and yeah yeah, yeah. 
well it depends which direction your career goes in obviously um but yeah it's a great process susan meehan from the daiwa foundation just says thank you for an amazingly phenomenal discussion one of my very favorite covid season events oh thank you susan oh, that's why you. that's why we love you thank you uh right uh, Mike Salter from the Japan Foundation says, loving the seminar, you talk a lot about the various hardships of Japanese life, like hik hikikomori and the work-life balance. Were any of those positions particularly difficult to articulate for you? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, go Mike. I don't, I don't know if they were difficult. Um, I, I, that's, it's, it, that, I think because that's come up earlier, isn't it? Was it difficult to do such and such? Mm. Um, I don't think it was difficult, but it was a constraint. Again, it was it was thinking, well, who am I? Who is this voice? Who is this person? And and I think, yeah, it's mm, that's it's a it's a difficult question. That mm. that that is. Um, I think because I think the hikikomori. I've, I mean, obviously, I'm not a hikikomori, but uh, at times in my life, uh, particularly when I was living in Japan, um, I, I didn't want to go out. You know, I'd have mm. days where I just wouldn't want to leave the house. It wasn't that I was ill or anything, but mm. that I just couldn't deal with the outside world. And that feeling, I think we've all had it. Um, mm. And I think you, you kind of get to the root of most emotions because you felt something similar or akin to that. Um, I mean, the... The reason the hikikomori in the Fotoko uh, story came about, I think, because I, I met um, I, early on in my time in Japan, I met a, a school refuser, a, a boy who who, who um, had stopped going to school. Mm -hmm. And then I think this was the nice thing about the academic community in Japan studies. I could go to lots of different talks on different subjects and, and learn lots of interesting things. But um, I remember someone giving a presentation on how um, pretty much all hikikomori were fotoko it's it's a progression mm. uh, and learning that makes you think well you know there, there's a connection between these things already um, yeah. yeah yeah no it's a great question um not to downplay the very serious issue of uh, hikikomori but i think maybe covid will turn us all into a little bit of hikikomori because there's yeah. a reluctance some days to go out i must admit living in london i'm 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 not missing the commute into downtown London I'm missing the, sometimes the social aspect but actually lecturing lecturing from home has its challenges and its negativities but actually being able to not lecture in your pajamas but just being able to not commute and not go out particularly as winter's approaching maybe we will all have a little bit of that emerging but not to downplay a very serious issue in Japan of course of hikikomori. Emiko-san asks does Nick have a cat? Did you grow up with cats? Lots of great authors owned cats um and a manga or artist and she said her cat helped her a lot with creativity and after her cat passed away she started writing memoirs in manga uh so we know you do have at least one cat I, i'm very disappointed that the cat hasn't appeared behind you uh in the zoom chat but would you like to answer that question <laughs> yes i do have a cat um she's called pansy and she's uh tuxedo, tuxedo cat um and yeah, of course, if you if you want her to come in and, and, and say hi, she won't. Yeah, so. <laughs> cats don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Owen asks, how did you find a publisher willing to take such risks with the first novel regarding structure, manga, etc.? Uh, was the novel simply in a more usual form when they accepted it? I think you've talked a little bit about that, that they helped you create that but they were also open to ideas as well so how did you find your publisher how did you find the wonderful poppy and atlantic books as well well this this is where i talk about how i'm really lucky to have an amazing agent so <laughs> that's ed ed wilson oh ed sorry um, i didn't mention ed as well yeah yeah ed wilson he's um so and this this is going back to chris's question about self-publishing versus the traditional route um that's it, you see, it, it wasn't me who picked Atlantic. It was it was Ed. So Ed knew because he's a literary agent and he works with lots of publishers and he knows lots of editors. He has a rough idea of 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 you know which publishers would would be interested and which editors would be interested. So that's another thing about the traditional route is that 
those things you you don't have to you don't have to think about you know I didn't have to think about like oh I, I have to submit to this publisher or you do going if for people who do want to write and a, a are interested in getting agents one bit of advice that i would say is um w the way that you can figure out um which agent you would like to to send to submit to would be to think well which books have i enjoyed in the past five ten years and then go to the acknowledgements in the back and you'll see their name um and find the books that 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 agent uh, represents the writers that that agent represents and um, that, that will help you in the first step, I think, um, of finding the right agent who will then do the rest of, yeah. So I, I, I know that's not answering the original question, but I think it's, yeah, that's, that's how you get to that stage. I think that's a good top tip there. Yeah. Um, Rosie asks, out of all the Japanese cat novels that you've read and studied, which one would you recommend the most or which cat was your favorite? That's a really good question. That's a great question. It definitely, uh, Tanizaki's a cat, a man, and two women. Um, nice. he's, yeah, he's the he's the man. Um, yeah. um, okay, a cat, a man, and two women. Go and read that one next, Rosie. I, I think you're going to like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, what advice would you give to anyone who wants to set a novel in a city? Uh, quite a broad question, but it's a really good question. Um, <laughs> it's it's to think about it from all angles. Um, this was something that Giles Foden, my my um, supervisor for my PhD, told me. He said you have to think about the the city from all angles, and also um, this was something he said, but it was something I always wanted to wanted to do. So uh, I, originally, I was so years ago, I was a Chaucerian. I was a, a, a <laughs> I was an academic. Well, no, I did an MA, but it was in medieval English mm. literature. So I, I'm a massive fan of Chaucer. And one of the things that Chaucer does is he looks at a cross section of society. And that was one thing that I really wanted to do um, too with this book. So it, it's to think about the, the city geographically and physically from all directions, think about it top down, you know, from bottom up, but also to think about the people who you're running into in the city and perhaps, you know, what social circles they move in and that kind of thing. So to try and write a city, I think you have to think about it everything and it's really really difficult i think writing about a city um mm. and i that's one of the things i one of the reasons why i wanted a novel in stories was because i think that that uh, lends itself better to to writing about a city with lots of different voices and lots of different people um yeah 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 well i think i think you do a great job of that because there are some moments where you feel like you are above the city looking down on it on a map of the city a sort of a live map and then there are moments where you're just experiencing the city through the lives of the people and then people reflecting on the city more broadly. So I think you do a really good job of coming at it from different angles. Plus, you get the, the flavor of the city. I mean, one thing I didn't mention is uh, like any good Japanese author or anybody writing about Japan, you do mention food. You bring up lots of little bits of food and it, it made me quite hungry reading some of the stories, particularly when they go to the Okonomiyaki restaurant. And uh, when they're picking up onigiri from the, the, the uh, Lawson's all the time, it makes me want some onigiri. Uh, so yeah, you do a good job of bringing food out, which is very important in Japan, of course. Tim asks, are the Japanese generally a nation of cat lovers? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, I, I remember reading, a, a, I've read a paper on this um, about, uh, it was an academic paper about uh, Japanese um, citizens opinions of cats in a certain neighborhood in Tokyo and it was really interesting because there were people who weren't fans of cats there, there are people who really don't like cats in Japan um, I don't know it's a difficult one because I I go back and forth with this I was I think I, I had to I got asked similar kinds of questions by a Japanese journalist who emailed me asking about Britain and, and cat novels um, because I think the UK has this image of being a dog loving country mm. and, and sure, you know, there are tons of dogs everywhere. I mean, there's more space, there are more parks, you know, um, mm. but at the same time, I'm kind of intrigued by the, the recent trend of Japanese cat books, you know, and who, who's reading these if, if, mm. uh, if British people are dog people and don't like cats, you know, what's going on there? I mean, it's, it's a difficult question to ask as a uh, answer, because I think, you know, I think dogs and cats are popular in most countries, um, and it's tough to it's tough to it's tough to make kind of generalizations about you know are they 
are they all cat people or are they, you know, mm. anyway, yeah. yeah. I think that's it. That is a difficult question to answer. I was in a Japan Society session earlier today um, on, on a completely different topic. Kathy Matsui was talking about womenomics and she made the point, and I assume her data is correct. She said that there are now more cats and dogs, registered pets, just cats and dogs in Japan than there are children under the age of 15. So, uh, so lots of people have pets in Japan, but whether they're swinging towards cats or dogs, I don't know. I didn't have that, that data, so. but definitely pets are popular. Uh, Filippo, uh, my SOAS colleague asks, out of curiosity, who is your Italian publisher that's being translated into Italian? Okay, um, this is really bad. I should know. I think it's Nord. Um, okay. I'm, at the top of my head, Casa Ed Editrice Nord Sul or something like that. It's um, yeah, I I'd have to look it up. Unfortunately, okay, to get so it exactly. maybe um, Filippo can I can forward that question on and forward yeah. and put you yeah. in touch with Filippo about that, um, just so that we can clarify that. That'd be great. Um, somebody asks, can you talk a little bit more about the editing process of the book? So you've talked about it a bit, like with the detective story, for example. But what would you say? What would you say are the major changes, if any, to the book during the editing process? Those, the ones I've talked about, are the two main changes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that Atlantic said, or uh, Poppy said, when I met with them, was that. They didn't. They didn't think the book needed much changing. So I was like, "Ah, it's fine. I don't have to do anything anymore." Um, but even with that, even with <clears throat> the idea that, that there wasn't much left to do, I still ended up having to 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 yeah to split that story into three and to rewrite a new final chapter. So if that gives any indication of the kind of like overall structural changes, but then I suppose like editing. It's a long process and you, you, you know, lots of changes, a lot, lot of things change and, and you, you kind of lose track of it. Um, it's, it's difficult to say. I don't, I don't think we changed it that much. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's tough to, the, I, I, the, the structural changes, the major ones were those two. Um, yeah. So yeah. Great. Uh, Olivia has put in capital letters, exclamation mark, show the cat. I think she wants your cat to appear. <laughs> Uh, but like we said, cats do not, cats are not dogs. They don't come when they're, when they're called. So I'm not sure we're going to have the, your, your cat. I assume that's what she's referring to there. Uh, Carolyn says, thanks for a super engaging and interesting event. She has to admit that she hasn't got around to reading the book yet. But uh, I mean, hopefully this has got her excited to read it. Um, she says she's uh, excited for you, can't wait to read it. She saw that David Mitchell read and commented on the novel. So how does it feel for you, Nick, to get the response and attention that you're getting? Um, also, are you interested in an academic career or more interested in writing novels? So I think she's asking, are you going to give up your day job? Are you going to become an author and a novelist? And how does it feel to have someone like David Mitchell commenting? Um... It's, it, it's, it's again, it goes back to 2020 being just the weirdest year of my <laughs> life. Um, it, just something I never ever expected happening. Um, yeah, I, right now I, I'm trying not to think about the book because I'm trying to focus on, book, on the second book. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm shocked at, at yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm touched, you know, overwhelmed uh, at, at how things have, have panned out. It's been, yeah, it's been lovely. I mean, I, I'm so, you know, people sending me cat photos on, on social media. It's just <laughs> things that I didn't, I mean, I should have guessed that that would happen, but. <laughs> no, that's yeah. brilliant. I'm just going to ask the final two questions that are in the chat already. So, um, because I wanted to wrap it up about 6.30, because it's a long time for you to be talking and concentrating. So I'm just going to ask the final two questions. Um, Philip says, has Nick watched any of the Japanese film adaptions of cat novels? And would he want a film? Um, I, I guess he's asking, would you like your novel to become a film or an anime or, or anything like that? I think that's the question. Um, I haven't watched any of the adaptations at all, actually. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, sh I should really, because I, I, you know, um, I'm sure there's... You're some... hardcore right, focusing on the writing only and the, the novels themselves. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the other thing that I was a bit worried about with, with the thesis was that there was a whole area that I just knew 
I couldn't go down but like like Ghibli um cats and mm. Ghibli and things like that so yeah. um I I kind of and also being in in, in a literature department I, my main focus was literature so um yeah but but saying that though I mean this is just a side note but um films and and uh I'd say you know the work of of um of uh Corrieda is really is really important to me uh I, I think I might have even meant, had one of the characters watch one of his films because I, I love his stuff so much. Um, another person who, who I really love is um, Satoshi Kon, um, like Paprika. That's an amazing depiction of, of Tokyo. And he's he's got an anime about uh, three homeless people called uh, Tokyo Godfathers. Um, I'm not, as Helen was saying earlier, like I'm not mad on manga and anime. Um, I do like some, but I'm not, I'm not a buff. So, um, but yeah, I think films are really important. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, we'll see, we'll see about uh, the, the cat and the, and the city TV <laughs> or, or film. Yeah. We'll yeah. See. Watch this space. You never know what, what will happen. <laughs> great question. And the, the last question is a great question as well. So what had you learned at the point of finishing your novel that you didn't know at the start? That's a great question. I don't know if that could be taken as a question about the novel. It could be taken as a question about you as a writer. So what have you learned that you didn't know at the start? <laughs> great That's question. Really, what have I learned? Um, I think, well, I'll, I'll just sort of cheat and talk about that one generally, but like, I think with- I don't with think writing, it's a cheat. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cheat and answer that one. Um, I think with writing, any, if you finish a first draft of a novel, um, I think people worry and say like, oh, you know, I want to get this published or whatever. Um, and they see that as being the achievement, you know, the publication as being the achievement. Um, but this this wasn't the first novel I've, I've written. It wasn't the first long thing that I've written. Um, it was the first thing that I've tried to publish um, because I didn't feel like the other things were good enough. But... That being said, even I think, you know, even though I did write a 130,000 word novel and then just do nothing with it, I think writing the novel and showing yourself that you can do it is, is, is something, is a great thing to learn, like knowing that it's possible to do it. Um, so I would say that that's one thing like everyone would kind of um, learn by writing a novel, that it is possible if you if you just put your head down and just do the work and commit yourself, it's possible. So I think that's one thing that everyone learns from writing a novel. Um, yeah, yeah, but that's a, that's a really difficult question. Um, yeah, but that's yeah. a great answer. Yeah, that's good. Okay, well, I mean, I'm just so grateful to you, Nick, that you agreed to come and kick off our seminar series. I think it's been a brilliant start. Um, it's been, it's just been really fun talking to you. I mean, I'm hope hopefully for people who who have read the novel, that was really interesting to to think about the novel in more detail to get answers to questions. Thank you to all the people who posed questions. Those of you who haven't read the novel yet, hopefully that will inspire you to read it. Um, remember, Christmas is around the corner. It's always a good idea to give somebody a nice gift. I recommend the paper uh, the paperback and hardback version, but it's also available in Kindle, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I sound like you're I sound like your agent now. But, um, I, I really want to thank you, Nick, for coming along and and talking to us about the novel. Um, I, I wish you every success. I mean, you've already had so much success already, but I wish you every success going forward with this novel, maybe a future film and for your second novel as well, wherever your career takes you. But it's been brilliant discussing with you. So thanks so much. Thanks very much for having me on, Helen. It was it was it's a pleasure to, to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm really grateful to SOAS for, for for inviting me. It was it was a lot of fun. And thanks yeah. to everyone who, who, who listened in as well. Yeah, there were some great questions and we'll put the recording up. So if, any, if you know of anybody who couldn't get into the to the event or missed out on a ticket, then um, we'll tweet that it's going to go up as well. Um, no sign of Nick's cat going to make an appearance, not in the room, Nick, no. No, no. <laughs> no. Okay, thank you everybody for a fantastic session and thank you Nick again.